Okay, this will be the lecture for chapter 32, and we'll be talking a little bit more about quantum mechanics. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a brief little foray through history and talk about how we discovered um, kind of the atom and our progress as we went from a nucleus to figuring out that there was something smaller than the nucleus. So we'll talk about the electron, we'll talk about the proton, we'll talk a little bit about atomic spectra and structure and how that led us to develop the model of the atom to probably a, the most easily conceptualized model, the Bohr model. We'll talk about why the Bohr model has discrete energy levels, which is related to electron waves, and we'll talk about quantum mechanics and something called the correspondence principle. Now, this is the atomic model that we're kind of familiar with today, where we're going to have some positively charged nucleus with protons and neutrons in there, and then we're going to have elect electrons that live in shells around this atom, and as the electrons jump between the shells, then they can emit um, light, or they could also preferentially absorb light, but it has to be certain colors. Not all colors can be emitted, not all colors can be absorbed, and we can absorb high energy light, and then we can uh, reflect lower energy light. So we could absorb, say, UV, and then put out some red. And the reason for that is because these electron shells, these orbits, they are discrete. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we kind of came around to that model. So a long, long time ago, people said, what is the smallest building block of nature? So let me take just a rock. And if I were to cut this rock in half, then I'd have some smaller rocks. And if I were to cut them in half, then I'd have even smaller rocks and even smaller and even smaller. Eventually, I'd, ha I'd have some gravel and then I'd have some sand. And they asked themselves, is there a limit? And this fellow came along around 400 BC. And he said, there is a limit. And this limit is going to be this teeny tiny small, bo um, small ball that he called Atmos, which looks a whole awful lot like Atom. And it cannot be divided anymore. So if we tried to, to cut this thing in half, then it cannot be cut in half. So the question we're going to answer is, is you know, how did we go from that theory into the theory that we have now? So we'll answer the question, who are all of these men's, are all of these men, starting with this fellow right here, whose name is Democrates. As I said, around 400 BC, um, he was looking for the building block of matter. And he asked the question, is there a limit to how many times we could divide something up? And he said that absolutely yes, there is a limit. And this limit is going to be this little teeny tiny thing, and it's going to look like a billiard ball. Um, it's going to be indivisible. And Atmos, oops, spelled it wrong in the previous slide, but that's okay, uh, means it cannot be cut any further. However, there are some basic problems with this model, but before we talk about those problems, it turns out that this was not accepted by some of the great philosophers of the time. To him, Atoms were small, hard particles that were made of the same material, and they could be different shapes or sizes, and different elements may have different things in them, and they're infinite in number, they can move, and they can join together to make bigger things. So we can make a boulder by joining little teeny tiny um, rocks together. <clears throat> as I said, the problem is, is he was not as famous as some of the other philosophers of the time, and this theory just generally did not catch on for quite a long time. Now, the great philosophers of the day, Aristotle and Plato, had a more respected theory, and they said there's four basic elements. There's going to be fire, there's going to be air, there's going to be water, and there's going to be earth, and we can make up um, any element out of these four things. One of the biggest problems with Democrates' model is, is this billiard ball. Well, the problem is that we couldn't see it. You can't touch it, you can't feel it, and you can't interact with it. And we could with all of those things. So here's just a quick little timeline of what we're talking about. And something I want to highlight is um, we're talking about times, well, after Democrates, after we work our way up here, um, we're talking about things that are about 200 years old. So atomic theory is relatively new, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that we were finally able to prove the presence of atoms. So in the 1800s, someone else proposed essentially Rockford's model, and then a fellow by the name of J.J. Thompson came around about 100 years later and said, we can actually sp split this billiard ball into smaller pieces. And then Rutherford came along, and he found some of those pieces. J.J. Thompson found some of the pieces as well. 
And this evolved about 10, 15 years later into the model that we kind of know today. And that is still evolving as we talk about this fellow by the name of Schrodinger. Now, cut to about the early 1800s, and there was a chemist by the name of John Dalton, and he performed a bunch of experiments that led to the acceptance of atoms, or at least kind of in theory. He still couldn't see them or prove that they were there, but he actually was um, pretty good at what he did, and he even published a paper with a table of atomic weights and lots of good stuff for his time. Um, what he said was all elements are made up of atoms, and different elements are made up of different atoms, and we cannot split these things up. They are indestructible. Same elements are going to be made of the same thing. Different ones are made up of different, and we can form compounds. For example, we could join two hydrogens and one oxygen and make this creature called water. And about 20 years later or so, a fellow by the name, a botanist by the name of John Brown came along, and he was able to observe um, the nature of atoms because he was looking at some pollen in a petri dish and he saw this thing called Brownian motion, which was, which was essentially banging um, atoms into a piece of pollen, making it take a random walk. But there's one teeny tiny theory problem with Dalton's theory, and that problem has to do with how atoms can interact with light. We know that if we were to shine some light onto an atom, that it can reflect back different frequencies. But if the atom is just a uh, billiard ball, then the biggest problem we have is it can't change the frequency of light that interacts with it. So here we kind of have a billiard ball, and we're shining some white light on this billiard ball. And you can just see the light bouncing off of this billiard ball. Yes, it can reflect back many colors of light, but the problem is it can't change the colors of light. So it turns out, based on what we know today, not what he knew at the time, but this model is kind of impractical because it doesn't allow this atom to change the color of the light that it, that it interacts with. Now, Dalton's theory was all well and good, and again, that was around 1800 or so. About 100 years later, a fellow by the name of J.J. Thompson came along, and he was the first person to realize that maybe we can split the atom up into smaller things. Maybe atoms are made up of um, different particles. What Thompson, or what Thompson was looking at was he was just looking at some high voltage across a tube. So what he did was he put some high voltage across this, and it allowed some current to pass through the gas. Now, kind of what came spinning out of this thing was something that had negative charge. And so as these electrons came shooting out of this thing, Thompson said, wait a minute, what's going on here? Um, atoms in the gas are uncharged, so whiskey tango foxtrot, where did these negative charges come from? Thompson reasoned, well, they had to come from within the gas, or they had to come from within the gas, or the atoms in the gas. So maybe in these billiard balls, these things called atoms, well, wait a minute, I know that these atoms are neutral, so there's got to be something that is negative inside of this thing, and there's got to be something that is positive inside of this. Something must be smaller than the atom, so we can actually divide this things up. He called these corpuscules, but today we actually call these negatively charged things electrons. And as I said, the, he knew that the gas was neutral, so there had to be both positive charges and negative charges within the atom. But Thompson never could actually find the positive charges. Still, he came up with a model, because that's what we do, is we try to better explain what we have learned about the world around us. And he called it the plum pu pudding model, but let's just call it the raisin bread model. He was English, they like plum pudding. And picture just having a loaf of raisin bread, and to Thompson, the bread itself was going to be made up of positive charges, kind of like this. And embedded in it are going to be these raisins, or plums if you will, and these plums have negative charges. And they're kind of scattered throughout it, and we have this um, bread that is naturally uncharged because we have equal positives and negatives. Now, this is a better model because we know that we can divide the atom, but it still has one teeny tiny problem. The problem with the plum pudding model is the fact that, well, only certain frequencies are going to interact with this atom. So we have the positive charge, uh, the positively charged bread. We have our single electron in there, and you can see that this thing is only interacting with one color, and it's going to be this ultraviolet color right here. And it can't really interact with the other colors, and more importantly, it can't change the other colors. 
So some teeny tiny problems with Thompson's model. Not too long after Thompson, there was an English physicist by the name of Ernest Rutherford. And so 1908, so less than 10 years, about 10 years or so after um, Thompson, um, he was actually do, working on an experiment that really didn't seem like it had much to do with figuring out what atoms are made out of. What he was essentially doing was he was um, directing a beam of positively charged alpha particles through some gold foil. So here we have go are going to essentially have some really thin gold foil. And what alpha particles are is essentially it's going to be an uncharged helium nucleus. So it's going to be two protons and two electrons. And they're called alpha particles. And we'll talk about them a whole lot more in the next chapter. But pay attention to the fact that it is positively charged. So he had a radioactive sample. And it was contained in some lead because lead is going to contain radioactive things. And what he kind of found were most of the par alpha particles went right through the gold foil, just like this. So ching, 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 ching. Few of them were deflected. So we're going to have some that kind of came off right over here. And very, very few were actually bounced in the backwards direction. And what was kind of going on here was um, most of the um, alpha particles went right through the atoms. So that says atoms are mostly made of um, empty space. The ones that were deflected, they actually got too close to a positively charged nuclei, and so they were pulled in. Very few actually went and hit the nucleus, and they bounced in the backwards direction. At least that's where Rutherford's thinking is going to take us. So he said the alpha particles must have hit something very massive, but what could it possibly be? So Rutherford said, well, the undeflected ones, they went right through empty space. So most of atoms are empty space, and that agrees with Bohr's model that we're kind of familiar with. Um, the ones that were deflected must have hit something very massive inside of this thing, and it's going to hit what we call, now call the nucleus. So he said atoms are going to have a nucleus, and they're going to have be made up of mostly empty space. So now perhaps Rutherford's model is not going to be plum pudding, but it's going to be a positively charged nucleus with an electron out here. And it's somewhere out here, most of the atom is empty space, with a very dense nucleus. Now, we'll come back to this when we talk about Bohr's model, but I do want to talk a little bit more about the discovery of the electron and how we know that the charge is actually quantized. So. What Thompson was looking at was he was looking just at putting a high voltage source across um, a, a gas filled tube. And the high voltage, we call the negative side the anode, or the cathode, the positive side the anode. And what we were essentially doing is, is we were energizing this gas and we were causing electrons to come out from a little teeny tiny slit right here. What we could do is we could prove that what came out of there had to have some charge to it. The way that we could do that was we could take a magnet, and magnets would have a north and a south, and if what came spitting out of this thing had some charge to it, then it would have to deflect. If it didn't have a charge, we wouldn't be able to deflect it. More importantly, if we were to flip this thing around, so the south was on top and the north was up there, then it would bend in the opposite direction. So that told us that whatever came out of this thing had to be charged. But the question is, is well, how much charge? So J.J. Um, Thompson said, well, uh, the deflection is going to depend on how much charge this thing has, as well as how much mass, how much inertia this thing has. More mass, more inertia, less deflection. More charge, more deflection, more force. Kind of makes sense. It also does turn out that the faster this thing was going, the less it would deflect because it would have less time to interact with that magnetic field. Then a fella by the name of Milliken came along, and he actually went ahead and he took some oil droplets, and he charged them up using electrons, and he put them into an electric field. And what he was able to do was he was able to take his oil drop, and it's going to have the weight, the mass times gravity in the downwards direction, and he messed around with the electric field such that the force due to the electric field was upwards. And he messed around with the voltage until these things balanced each other out. So the downward force of gravity was balanced by the electrical force. And what he found, <clears throat> what he found out was the amount of charge on each oil droplet was a multiple of a single value. And it turns out that this single value was the 
um, charge of an electron. So actually he determined what was called the charge to mass ratio for the electrons, which is a really important quantity. But more importantly, the mass of an electron is quantized, and we can't split that up into smaller pieces. The charge of an electron is also quantized, and that is something also that we cannot split into smaller pieces. This would also imply that the nucleus, the positively charged nucleus, which we now, are now know are made up of protons, um, also has to be quantized, and it's going to have an equal but opposite charge on it. Now we know today that the charge of an electron is going to be equal to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, and the charge of a proton is going to be positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Now, just kind of as an aside, in subatomic physics, it turns out we can split like the proton into smaller pieces, but we really don't want to go there in physics 102.